Hi there! In this video, I will show you how to make a very simple and fun game in Godot. In this game, the player plays as a bouncing ball, and their goal is to reach the end of the level. If the ball falls off the level, the game restarts, and when the player reaches the goal, they move on to the next level. This is a great game to make as your first 3D project, although you do need to have at least some experience with Godot. You need to know your way around the UI, you need to know what scenes and nodes are, and you need to understand the basics of programming in GDScript. I will do my best to show and explain everything, but if you get confused at any point, just ask questions in our Discord server or in the comments. Before we begin, follow the link under this video to download the assets we will use to make this game, and the final project files you can refer to in case you get stuck. Without further ado, let's get started! First, we need to create a new project. In the project manager, click the new project button. We will call our project Let's Roll Tutorial. Click the create folder button to create a new empty folder for our project. Then click create and edit to create our project. Now you need to import the assets. Unzip the archive with the downloaded assets and drag the assets folder into your project folder. Godot will import assets automatically. In the assets folder, you will see the blocks.gltf file. This file was exported from Blender and it contains the models we will use to build our level. The gltf file itself is not editable in Godot, so when you double click on the file, choose New Inherited. That will create a new Godot scene in the TSCN format, which we can actually edit. Save the newly created scene as blocks.tscn. Our goal is to be able to build game levels out of these blocks. To accomplish that, we will use the grid map node. It will help us to place these blocks into the levels quickly and interactively. To be able to use block models in grid map, we need to convert them into mesh library. That is very simple. Click scene, convert to, mesh library, and save it as blocks.meshlib. Our next step is to use these blocks to build the first level for our game. Create a new 3D scene, name it level 01, and save it in the environment folder. Add a grid map node, and drag the blocks.meshlib file that we have just created onto the mesh library slot. Now we need to change some settings. Set the cell size to 4x4x4 to make the size of the cell match the size of our block models. Uncheck center X, center Y and center Z, since we don't need our blocks to be automatically centered. Now you can select the blocks from the list of meshes in the grid map panel and build a level out of them. You can use Q and E keys to lower or raise the construction grid and A, S, D, W keys to rotate the blocks. You'll be mostly using the S key to rotate the blocks around the Y axis. Right click on the block removes it. And just like that, we have made the level our ball can roll around in. Now it's time to make the ball that is going to roll around the level and jump as the player controls it. Let's start by setting up a new scene for our ball. Create a new scene with rigid body node as its root and name it ball. Save it inside of the player folder. We are using the rigid body node because we want Godot to automatically calculate physics for our bouncing ball. Instead of manually controlling the position and rotation of the ball, we are just going to set up its physics properties, such as mass and friction, and then apply forces to the ball, making it roll around and jump. Godot's physics engine will do the rest of the work, making sure that the ball interacts with the environment realistically. At the moment, the rigid body node has a yellow warning triangle next to it. That's because every rigid body must have a collision shape assigned to it. Collision shape represents a simplified shape of the object which Godot will use when it simulates physics. Add a new collision shape node under the ball node. And under the shape property create the new sphere shape. From the assets folder, drag the pixarball.obj model onto the scene, rename it as model, and reset its position to zero to place it into the center of the scene. Assign a new spatial material and drag the pixarball.png texture from the assets folder into the materials albedo texture slot. Set the materials roughness to 0.4 to add a nice highlight to the ball and make it shiny. Now let's set up a camera. Create a new position 3D node, name it camera rig, and create a camera node under it. Check the current checkbox to tell Godot that this is the camera through which the player will be looking at the scene. We want the camera to be slightly behind and above the ball. So, move the camera 2.85 units up and 3.5 units back and rotate it minus 30 degrees around the X axis. Notice that the camera is the child of the camera rig node and it is positioned relative to the camera rig. Think of camera rig as an invisible arm that the camera is attached to. As the ball moves, we will make sure that the camera rig stays in the center of the ball and the camera will be moving along with it, looking at the ball from the constant distance and angle. 
Now you can save the scene, go back to the level scene and click on the link icon to add the ball into the level. Lift the ball one unit up on the Y axis so that it's resting on the floor. Now we can try running our game. When you click the play button for the first time, Godot will ask you to select the main scene for the game. Select level of 1. You will see that our game is running, our ball is racing at the beginning of the level and we are looking at it through the camera we've just set up. Now we are finally ready to do the exciting part. Let's make the ball move. First, let's set up the keys the player can press to move the ball. Go to project, project settings, input map and add the actions forward, back, left, right and jump. Then click the plus button next to each action and assign keys to them. W for forward, S for back, A for left, D for right and space for jump. That will allow us to execute code in response to player pressing these keys. Now we can write the code that tells the ball how to move. Add a new script to the ball node, switch the template to no comments, because we don't want Godot to automatically add a bunch of boilerplate code and click create. We create a variable called rolling force. You can set it to higher or lower values, depending on how quickly you want the ball to roll in response to player pressing the buttons. We have the export keyword before the variable, so that you can conveniently modify its value in the inspector. Let's create a physics process function. The code inside of this function is executed many times per second. It keeps running in the loop continuously as long as the player is playing the game. In order to respond to the key presses, we have the if statements. They tell Godot which line of code to execute when the player is holding the corresponding key. When the player is holding the forward key, we will run the code that makes the ball roll forward. When the player wants to move left, we will run the code that makes it roll left and so on. The rigid body node comes with a bunch of physics variables. You can modify them during the game to control the behavior of your object. In this case, we want to change the angular velocity of the ball, which will cause it to roll. To make the ball roll forward or back, we will spin it around the x-axis and to make it roll left or right, we will spin it around the z-axis. When the player wants to move forward, we will subtract the rolling force from the angular velocity and when the player wants to roll back, we will add the rolling force to make the ball spin in the opposite direction. We also need to multiply the rolling force by delta. Explaining the meaning of delta is out of scope of this tutorial, so don't worry if you are a bit confused by it. All you need to know now is that the physics process function typically runs 60 times per second, but it may sometimes run more or less frequently depending on how fast or slow your computer is. This is a problem, because we are changing the angular velocity every frame and we would get different results depending on the frame rate at which your computer is able to run the game. To solve this problem, we multiply rolling force by delta, which represents the time that has elapsed since the last time the physics process function has been executed. That will make our angular velocity change at a consistent rate every second, independently of, of how often our computer is able to run the physics process function. If you want to learn more about how delta works, you can follow the links under this video for a more detailed explanation. Here's the complete code for our movement function. We change the angular velocity around the x-axis when we want to roll back or forward, and we change the angular velocity around the z-axis when we want to roll left or right. Now, if we run our game, we'll see that our ball is rolling when we press the buttons, but the camera is rolling along with it. Let's fix this. Camera rig node is a child of the ball node, so as the ball spins, the camera inherits all of its transformations and spins along with it. We want the camera rig's rotation to be independent of the ball, but we want its position to stay in the center of the ball as it moves. To accomplish the first part, we will use set a stop level function. It will tell the camera rig to ignore the ball's transformations. Godot will treat the camera rig as if it wasn't parented under the ball node. We will place this code inside of the ready function. The ready function runs once at the beginning of the game, as soon as the ball is added to the scene, which is exactly what we want. Now the camera rig ignores the ball's rotations, but also ignores its movement. In order to fix this, we will add the lines of code that will drag the camera rig along with the ball every frame, continuously making sure that it is placed in the center of the ball. GlobalTransform.origin represents the global position of the ball. Camera rig .global transform origin represents the global position of the camera rig. Every frame of the game we will move the camera rig into the center of the ball, so as the ball moves, it keeps dragging the camera rig along with it. Now our camera follows the ball, which is great. We have one small issue though. When the ball jumps or bumps into a border, it's going to suddenly change directions, and so will the camera. These sharp camera movements will make it uncomfortable to play. It would be nice if it felt like our camera was on a spring, smoothly following the ball, ignoring its sudden movements. To accomplish that, we will use the lerp function. 
When you pass two positions and await value to this function, it returns you the intermediate position between these two points. For example, if the weight value you give it is 0.5, it will return the position right in the middle. If you pass it 0.1, it will return the position 10% of the way from the first point to the second point. We can use this function to smooth our camera movements. We will interpolate the camera position between its current position and the position of the ball. Every frame our camera will get 1% closer to the ball, gradually catching up to it. So as you can see now, our camera movements are much more pleasant and enjoyable to play with. We don't need the effect to be quite so pronounced, so we'll change the value to 10%. Now the camera movements are smooth and satisfying. If you try playing the game right now, you'll notice that the ball feels too light and too slippery. We want to modify its physics properties so that the gameplay feels more fun and controllable. First, go to the project settings and change the physics engine to Godot Physics. I chose to use this engine instead of the default one, because it works better when the game is exported to be played in the browser. If you don't care about that, the default engine will work just fine, but the physics parameters I'm using in this tutorial are picked with this engine in mind. Go to the properties of our ball node. We make it heavier and increase the friction with the floor to make the ball easier to control. We add some bounciness to make the ball bounce off the floor and walls, making it more fun and challenging to play. Also set angular damp to 1, so that ball gradually comes to a halt when we don't press any buttons. Now the gameplay feels much more pleasant and satisfying. Now let's add the jumping functionality. We only want our ball to be able to jump when it touches the floor. We don't want the player to be able to jump when the ball is in the air. To find out whether the ball is touching the floor, we will use a raycast node. Add a raycast node. Name it floor check. In the properties, set enabled to true and change its length on the y-axis to minus 1.5 units to make the raycast slightly longer than the radius of the ball. Imagine the raycast as a short arrow pointing from the center of the ball towards the ground. We can check whether this arrow is currently intersecting with the floor and if it does, we'll know that the ball is touching the ground and we should allow the player to jump. We want the raycast to be constantly pointing towards the ground, but you'll notice that it has the same problem as we had with the camera. Raycast is parented to the ball, and it's going to rotate along with the ball when it rolls. The solution will also be the same as the one we had with the camera. Let's add the line of code that tells the raycast to ignore the ball's transformation. And then, in the physics process, we set raycast's position to always be equal to the ball's global position, so that it moves along with the ball. Now let's add the jump impulse variable. The higher it is, the higher the ball will be able to jump. Finally, we can add the jumping code. Running the function is colliding on the floor check node, tells us whether the raycast intersects with the floor. It will return true when it does, and we'll know that the player is allowed to jump. If the ball is on the floor and the player just pressed the jump button, we propel the ball upwards using apply impulse. This function applies a force to the physics object. It takes a vector that is used as the direction of the force, and its length is used as the strength of the force. Vector 3.up is a short vector pointing upwards, in the direction where we want our ball to jump and we multiply it by jump impulse to increase how much energy is going to be added to the ball. That way we control how high the ball is able to jump. If you play the game now, you will see that our ball is able to jump and our movement code is complete. Now it's time to make our game look pretty. Go to project, project settings and set the following settings. Set the game resolution. I prefer 960 by uh, 540 because it's reasonably small and it has a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Set window stretch mode to 2D and set its aspect ratio to keep. That will make it possible to resize the game window. In the rendering quality, set MSAA, which stands for multi-sample anti-aliasing, to 4X. This is the most important setting. It enables anti-aliasing, which removes the jagged lines at the edges of the objects and makes the game look much nicer. Double the shadow map size to improve the quality of the shadows. Now we are going to set up the lights. Add a directional light node to the level, it will represent the main light in this scene, the sun. Set its rotation to minus 60, 60 and 0. Set its color to something uh, orangish or yellowish to make it look like the sun. Increase its energy to 2 to make it brighter and enable the shadow. You can find the exact color values I'm using under this video. Now you can add a new world environment node. It will allow us to configure the environment lighting and add some post-processing effects. Create a new environment and set the settings as follows. Switch the mode to custom color to be able to set a custom color for the sky. Make the ambient light blue to represent the light bouncing around in the atmosphere. I think a little atmospheric perspective will make the game look much better. 
So you can enable the fog, make it a bluish color, and decrease its depth begin value to make it start closer to the camera. Now switch the tone map to ACES. Tone map is an option that tells Godot how to transform colors from the colors paste used by the rendering engine into the colors that our monitors are using. This stuff gets really technical and complicated, and to be honest I don't entirely understand it, but the bottom line is that using this tone map makes the game look better, and generally people seem to recommend to be using it instead of the default linear mode. Finally, enable the color adjustments and set the following values. Set brightness to 0.75, set contrast to 1.5, and set saturation to 1.2. I have simply set them to values that seem to look nice after a bit of experimentation. If you run the game now, you will see that it looks much prettier. The next step is to learn how to restart the game when the ball rolls off the level. Create a new area node and name it Death Zone. Add a collision shape, create a box shape, make it quite a bit larger. Let's say that it extends to 150 on X, 1 on Y, and 150 on Z, and move it a little bit down so that it's underneath the level. We are making the collision shape pretty large, so that whenever the ball falls off the level, it inevitably crosses it. Attach a new script to the area. And connect the body entered signal of the death zone area to the script. When you connect a signal to a script, Godot will automatically create a function for you that will execute when this event occurs. Different nodes come with different predefined signals. In this case, we want to use body entered signal, which will run this function as soon as any kind of physics body, for example our ball, enters this area. In this function, we first need to make sure that the physics body that enters this area is called the ball. Remember that uh, there can be other physics bodies in the scene. For example, our level geometry itself is a static body, and we don't want to run this code if a part of the level accidentally happens to overlap this area. And once the ball has entered this area, we run a function called reload current scene, which is pretty self-explanatory. It is a function that reloads the current scene and restarts the game. So now if you play the game and accidentally fall off the level, the ball is going to fall down, cross the area, and the code is going to execute, which will restart the game. Finally, the last thing we need to do to complete our game is to be able to switch between the levels. As soon as the ball reaches its target, we want to move the player to the next level. Just like with the test zone, we will create an area node that will run a function as soon as the ball reaches it. So create a new area node, name it victory zone, add a box collision shape, set its dimensions to 2 by 1 by 2 and place it under the target block, so that as soon as the ball reaches the target, it will touch the victory zone area. Attach a script to the area, and connect the body entered signal to it, just like we did with the death zone. We will export a variable that contains a path to the scene that contains the next level. Notice that we are passing a specific type hint in the parentheses. That will tell Godot that this string contains a path to the file, and it will add a convenient property in the inspector that allows you to select the path to the file containing the next level. As soon as the ball touches the victory zone, we will change the active scene to the level we have selected. Now all we need to do is to build a couple more levels for our game. Go to Scene, click New Inherited Scene, and create a scene inherited from level 01 and call it level 02. Scene Inheritance allows you to use the original scene as the template to build multiple variations on it. In this case we are using level 01 as the template uh, for all of our future levels, which will just be slight modifications of the first level. Edit the grid map node to build a new level. And build a couple more levels. Once the levels are done, go to the victory zones and select the paths to the next level. The victory zone in the first level will lead to the second level. The victory zone in the second level will lead to the third level. Now if you play the game and successfully reach the area, we are being teleported to the next level. And that's it, that's our game. Congratulations, our game is complete. I hope this video was fun and useful to you. If you have found anything confusing or experienced any issues, come join our Discord and ask me questions. I will be happy to help you out.